Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Happy. Welcome to Mount Vernon. Before we go any further in worship, take a moment. Be sure that you have greeted those around you with peace and the joy of Christ today. several announcements to bring to your attention. First, if you are a visitor here this morning, if you've not been here before, we want to warmly welcome you. I know we have a few down front. We have somebody in the back who said, please do not make me raise my hand, so we're not going to do that. But if you're a guest, we're glad you're worshiping with us on this first Sunday in the new year. A couple announcements. First, on January 18th, the community is celebrating ecumenically Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. So as always, there will be a celebration at Bethlehem Baptist Church, which is just down Sherwood Hall Lane. Mount Vernon choir members, I guess, are going to be participating. Uh, the service is going to begin at 4 o'clock, so if you're interested, mark your calendars. And if you'd like to sing, I'm sure Betsy would love to have you um, join the Mount Vernon folks who will be singing in that joint choir. The state treat is coming up at the end of the month. Um, again, take a flyer. They're at both exits and entrances. They're over in Fellowship Hall, um, and you can sign up for the various portions of it. We now have sign-up sheets in the narthex to the bulletin board on the left as you leave, and over in Fellowship Hall. You only need to sign up in one of the two places. Um, we will combine those lists, but let us know just roughly how many are going to be at the various portions of the retreat. You can come to one, two, three, or all, or all four of the portions of it, so look for more information about that. Offering envelopes are in the back. Melinda has put those out. They will be there another week, so be sure to, to take one of those if you're looking for um, a way to give to the church. And also, Mary just reminded me that on those pew envelopes, or on the offering envelopes, there's a new line this year that says Capital Campaign. Don't pay any attention to that yet. Okay? You'll hear more about that as the year goes on. You don't have to worry about that at all right now. And Wilda let me know, um, tomorrow, is it Wilda? Meals on Wheels. We participate in Meals on Wheels. Two of our, the folks from Mount Vernon who participate are not able to go. So if you are available to help with Meals on Wheels, what time is it? What time? 10.30 tomorrow morning, a couple hours it takes? Two hours. If you can help out with that, Wilda, raise your hand. Let, let Wilda Armstrong know. And Bill, you have an announcement about Vic Hop? I do. Uh, we have to meet for one more dinner. Great. Any other announcements that need to be? Yes. Great. Okay. Thanks, Anita. Anything else, Chad? That just means you both need to be here. It's really very simple, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. No, I'm just kidding. If you are, we need people, sometimes it's just a matter of pushing a button on the projector or the computer going through the music. So if, if you can help out in any way, I'm, I'm just kidding. We, we really do need help up there. Let, let Corey or Chad know about that. 
Anything else? All right. Well, then, uh, again, on this first Sunday of the new year, let us come together with one heart, with one mind, and together worship God. scripture reading today is Psalm 133. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, running down on his collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forever.
Can you guys all see this? Yeah. What is it? It's a cross. Is there, what's on the cross? Yeah, there's a pig on the cross. What else do you see on our cross? Flowers, a house, chicken, trees. What, is there something special about this cross, Emerson? No? Did your mom and dad tell you to put a cross in the children's bag? <laughs> yes. Well, um, this, yes, go ahead. What do you, do you see something else on it? It's something special about a church. A cross might communicate something special about a church. Well, if you guys have been looking around in here this morning, normally we just see a cross when we look up front in terms of symbols. I mean, there's a pulpit and a baptismal font and a communion table. But this morning, besides the cross, there are some other really important symbols over here. Do you see what they are? Did you notice these things over here? Yeah, let, let's look at these things. So we got a cross up there. Then anybody know what this is right here? Can what kind of candles? Hanukkah figgy candles. A Hanukkah figgy candles. Yeah, what is it called? Do you remember? Menorah. A menorah, right. A menorah and a yarmulke, which is what would a man would wear if he went to worship. In what tradition or what religion? Judaism, right. Now, how about this funny looking thing right here? What is it? It's a person's head. Do you know who that is? That's Buddha. That's the Buddha right there. And what religion is is the Buddha important in? Do you know? Which one? Buddhism. Buddhism. Okay, so we've got Judaism, we've got Buddhism, and then right here, do you know what book this is? It's not a Bible. This is a Quran. Do you know what book the Quran is important in? What religion? Islam. Islam. So those three religions are just three of the ones that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks. They're all really different. There are some very unique things about Christianity that that would point to why I have a cross in my house, but you're probably not going to find <coughs> these things because I'm a Christian. But there's so much that we have in common. People with other religions, they love God just as much, sometimes maybe more than some of us do. And so it's important for us to understand them and to learn about them. So hopefully, how many of you guys stay in here during my sermon? Do some of you stay in here? Sometimes? Hopefully some of you maybe will learn something about all of these religions and, and maybe even talk about them with your mom and dad on the way home, all right? But, having said that, we follow Jesus. And this cross reminds us of that all the time, okay? So thanks for bringing that in. And who would like to take this, uh, the children's sermon bag home? Who, 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 has not, who has not had it yet? Have you not had it? She's had it. Now, has anybody not had it yet? Okay, you can you can take. Will you be here next week? Uh, you guys here next week? Jake? No. You, uh, how, how about? Will you stay here? Okay, you're gonna be here next week, Joy. You're gonna be here next week. Your dad isn't here. If you're not gonna be, tell me if you're not gonna be here, okay? Because I kind of freak out when you wear the bag. Okay. Let's pray, and then you guys can all go back to your seats. Dear God, we thank you for the cross of Jesus. Help us to know all we can about what that cross means and help us to learn why we want to follow Jesus. In his name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Okay, thank you.
Listen again now to God's word, this time as it comes to us from 2 Chronicles chapter 15. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, he was found by them. In those times, it was not safe for anyone to go or come, for great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. They were broken in pieces, nation against nation and city against city, for God troubled them with every sort of distress. But you, take courage. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Friends, the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful. Thanks be to God. So my entire family was getting ready to spend Thanksgiving in Washington, D.C., and my father was, I think, more excited than anyone. All 23 of us had cleared the dates The schedule for our time together had been set. Thanksgiving dinner responsibilities had been divvied up. And now the only thing left for my dad to worry about was the weather. So when he spoke to the woman whose B&B we rented for the week, he jokingly said to her, I hope you're going to take care of the weather for us. And she laughed and said that she'd definitely be praying for us. To which my dad responded, well, what if we're not praying to the same God? Not sure whether that's funny or not, are we? Not sure what to make of that. When he told me this, that's exactly how I felt. I, I wanted to say, well, like, Dad, do you think there's more than one God that we pray to? Is it possible Do you think that that we Christians are seeking after, attempting to worship, striving to follow one deity, while other people from other faiths seek and worship and follow another God? Or is it possible that there is just one God that we're all attempting to relate to and communicate with, and we just do so in a variety of different kinds of ways. These are the kinds of questions we're going to be considering together here in worship and in adult education over the next couple of weeks. We're going to be studying some of the world's major religions, and we're going to consider how they might relate to Christianity. I've titled the series, Jesus Speaks to the Religions of the World. And I have to be honest and say that I wanted to preach a series, I've been wanting to preach a series like this for several years, and I've put it off. Well, as today got closer and closer, I wished I had put it off again, because it's an overwhelming topic. And it's, it's one that in which we need to move very gingerly and carefully. Because while we passionately believe what we do, and while I feel as though I need to start by saying, I love Jesus and have no desire to follow any other path, it's still important for us to know and to understand other religions And not just to be critical of them, but to see how much common ground can be found in all of them. After listening to the Morrison's son speak with us about Judaism this morning, I am more convinced of that as ever. As a 
I think he's reformed. Would he say he was a reform or reconstructionist Jew? Very far toward the left on the spectrum of Judaism. As he spoke, I found myself saying, I believe in all of that. Everything you're saying, I would embrace. But I am still a follower of Christ. And you need to keep that in mind as I share over the next several weeks. My hope. My hope is to lift up some of the differences, to point out perhaps why at least I in my life am walking in the steps of this one whose birthday we just celebrated, why I am not in some other faith tradition, because I am not just here because I was raised in a Christian home in a supposedly Christian country. I have done enough study of other religions to know that my choice is to follow the Christ. But that is not to say it is the only way for us to know God. My attempt in this series is twofold. And that is to help us understand these other major religions of our world. And also to discover the incredible amount of common ground that exists among us. Because only when we move to that ground will we ever understand what it means to coexist together? So, having said that, if you were in Sunday school, if you were paying attention during my children's sermon this morning, we're starting today with Judaism. And I'm going to let you start. What do you know already about Judaism? They read the Torah. Okay, the first five books of Judaism. We say the Old Testament, Daniel was kind of offended, I think, this morning when he said, like, is there a new one? You know, that we, we generally more respectfully would say the Hebrew scriptures, Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those are the holy books in Judaism. Great, Elise. What else? We know that Jesus was a Jew. He practiced the Jewish faith. What else do you know about Judaism. Okay, they celebrate Passover, which is usually right around Easter. This year, it will be on Good Friday. What else? They go to temple on Friday night, synagogue, okay? Okay? Okay, lots of different interpretations, kind of like Christianity. I was interested to hear him talk about the denominations in Judaism, Orthodox, Conservative, Okay, that it's an attempt to give a scholarly interpretation of the Torah, of the Torah, the, the Old Testament books, okay? What's the biggest difference between Christianity and Judaism? Jesus. Jesus. They do not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Messiah of Israel. Judaism is the world's oldest monotheistic religion with a history that goes back more than 3,000 years. Its holy book, as we've already said, is the Torah, the first five books of the Christian Bible. It is a faith that is rooted in God's covenant relationship with the people of Israel. In most instances, and this is where this series is going to get so muddy, because you just like you can't lump all of Christendom into one category, you can't do that with Judaism either. But in most instances, Judaism, when it is a religion, And some would argue that it is no longer just a religion, but a culture. In in most of Judaism, it is a law-based religion. Now, a typical Reformed understanding of Judaism would be that Jewish law is nothing more than a set of general guidelines for living rather than a set of restrictions. But in most of Judaism, it's all about the law. In 2012, 
The world Jewish population was estimated to be about 14 million, roughly 0.2% of the world's population. So it's the smallest of the religions we're going to deal with, but we're going to deal with it because they are our brothers and sisters. Our roots as Christians are in Judaism and some of the major religious conflict that is going on in the world today involves Judaism. <coughs> so we're going we're gonna to look at it in some detail this morning. It's the smallest religion, and, and it's an important one for, un, want, for us to understand. Most of the Jews, Daniel pointed out today, live where? In the world. In the United States. Yep. 82% of the Jewish population is in Israel and in the United States. We would do well to know more about what they believe. Marcus Ford, in his book, The First Paul, says that Paul had originally hoped that Christianity and Judaism would be one unified religion. And for a long time, it was. Christianity, followers of Jesus, were just seen as a sect of Judaism. But the intimacy of our relationship would not last for long. And I would contend this morning that there are two primary theological differences. If you want to know what is really at the heart of the difference between traditional Judaism as a religion and Christianity, it is first about grace and second about the Messiah. Okay? Grace and the Messiah. Let's start with grace. Grace. In spite of some of the changes that have taken place in Reformed Judaism, spirituality for most traditional Jews is law-driven. The 613 laws, and that's how many there are, that you can find in the Old Testament were originally designed to make the Jewish people more holy and more acceptable in the eyes of God. That's what the law was designed to do. That's why it was created. They were designed to keep people pure, holy, in a state that made them acceptable to God. And this is one of the things that Christ followers believe Jesus came to change. Now again, many Jews have accepted that today, but it is what led to the break between Judaism and Christianity. What Christians came to understand, and what I think much of Reformed Judaism also embraces today, is that however one talks about God, or understands God, mercy and grace must be central. An angry God who punishes people, like some of the inferences in this morning's references in Second Chronicles, an angry God who is retributive and vengeful in character, that is not a God worthy of our worship. We human beings are not perfect. We know that. We were created that way. And we will never be perfect. So to think that God would demand that of us? To think that that would be the expectation of this creator? To think that God would really be concerned about which days of the week we can or cannot purchase alcohol or work? To think that God really cares about whether or not we eat meat and dairy products together? To think that God would really care whether or not I have a fish sandwich or a hamburger on Fridays in Lent. To think that God cares whether or not my head and hair are covered. It presents just a very narrow understanding of holiness and divinity. Christians have sought to communicate that for years. Not always well. But it's one of the things that led to the break with Judaism. 
It's why we sing today with such passion and conviction about God's amazing grace. The idea that God's love is unconditional, unmerited, that we can't earn it by keeping any law that is unique to Christianity. It's what makes unmerited favor in Presbyterianism so compelling. And it's one of the two major differences between Christianity and Judaism. It's all about grace. Now the second one is the one most of us are, are most familiar with, and that's all about the understanding of Messiah. Jews do recognize Jesus as a great prophet. They do see him as an important teacher, but he is not the promised Messiah. And they don't regard him the way we do because they don't see the world as having changed all that much as a result of his life. Think about that. The Jewish people rejected Jesus as the Messiah because they didn't see him change things as radically as they anticipated. Unfortunately, like many segments of Christianity, the transformation that traditional Judaism longed for saw God as the one responsible for bringing it about. It was God's job. God was the one who would send his Messiah, the promised one to earth, and change everything, make everything better, heal all of our sins, and make us in right relationship with one another. The Messiah didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that. So he must not be the anointed one. Now today, there is this concept of Tikkun Olam, that Daniel talked a lot about, where people see themselves as participating in this transformation of the world. But in traditional Judaism, that was not prominent like it was not prominent in early Christianity. You and I know countless Christians today who see changing the world as God's job. God's job. And so we go into our corners and we go to our prayer meetings and the most we can do to change the world is pray for it. We've understand, understood for a long time that that is not exactly the way God works. Christians and many Jews don't accept that. So those are the two major differences. This whole idea of grace and this whole idea of a promised Messiah restoring creation. There are major differences. But while they are important, and while they are significant, we have so much more in common. At the heart of the Jewish faith is the notion of one God. The father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who has covenanted to be their God, not necessarily exclusively, but there's a real notion that they are God's people and the apple of God's eye. We would all do well to recognize that. In exchange for this status that we've all been given, for all the good that God has done, we want to be faithful. We want to live in a manner that honors God and glorifies God. Not with what we eat, not with the songs that we sing, but the way we live our lives, caring and loving one another. One of the things my family did while they were all here over Thanksgiving was attend the performance of Fiddler on the Roof over at Arena Stage. And the lead, Tevia, anybody see it? Did anybody go see that? Some of, some of, the lead was absolutely amazing. And um, he, when he did that song, Tradition, I would sing it for, for, for you, but I would embarrass myself. You know that song, that wonderful song, Tradition. Um, as I listened to him sing about tradition, I realized why the story is such an important one for us today. Because while the world continues to change, 
And while there is much needed change that needs to occur, there are some traditions that we need to hang on to. We cannot forget the stories of the men and women of faith who have gone before us, telling and retelling those stories. They keep us grounded. The way we understand them and apply them might, might change, but we can never stop telling the stories. And that is one of the practices that keeps Jews and Christians faithful. And so whether we embrace the stories of the Bible as literal or just metaphorical, it doesn't matter. The story cannot be lost, and we can never cease telling them. If Judaism is about anything, it is about tradition. The Hebrew scriptures are full of stories that the Jewish people are telling and retelling and celebrating again and again. The 3,000 year history of the Jewish people is all about trying to understand their walk with God. And 3,000 years is a long time. So there's a lot of stories to tell. Whether it's remembering the way God through Moses led the people from Egyptian slavery. Or the story of Esther that we studied in the fall about God saving the Jewish people from annihilation by the Persians. We need to hear the stories. We need to remember how faithful God always is to all of us. The Jewish people understand life is not easy. Blessings are not always material. Obedience does not guarantee a life that is free of trials and tribulations. The Jewish people know that as a people. We know that as individuals. But God is still God. And God's people are still God's people. So, we can hang on all of this common ground that we have together. We need to learn to coexist with one another. We need to get along. And we can do that by knowing our differences, but by also remembering and celebrating all that we have in common. Religion. Religion. Certainly the ones that we are going to be studying over the next few weeks, they give structure to our lives. They give shape to our values. They give us a path to follow in this life. They give us a worldview to embrace. And in spite of all the wars, and there are many that have been fought over religion, the good that has been done by people of faith, by people who bow in synagogues, pray in church, kneel in mosques, chant in temples. The good that has been done by people of faith simply cannot be matched. And as far as what Jesus might have to say to any of us, Christians included, his words would probably be pretty harsh. None of you have me all figured out. So show some humility. Find the common ground and just love one another. <coughs> Friends, may the food that we feast on at this table this morning equip us all for that holy task of just showing some humility and loving But our ushers, please come forward to receive the morning meal. <laughs>
Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. All who are seeking to know God. All who are seeking to love God. And all who are seeking to do so in the way of Jesus are not just invited, but encouraged to commune with us and with our Lord this day. Both the Hebrew scripture and the Christian scripture is about humanity's attempt to know God. And over and over again, when we tell and retell the stories, we find that we fall short. We, we miss the mark. We fail to live up to the high and holy calling of the Christ. But God never abandons us. God continues to call us to God's self, and in the ultimate act of love and the gift of Jesus, we see what it means to be a people who live sacrificially, who give our lives away in service to others. As we commune at this table, that is the light for which we are strengthened. So come, eat, drink, feast on the saving message of the Christ. Let us pray. God, as we come to this table today, may these elements be for us set apart from their common and everyday use, reminding us all of the body and the blood of the Christ child. As we remember not just his birth, but his life and his death, may we be resurrected with him to a new way of being in this world. May these elements become powerful symbols of the new life we are called to live. And may this time we have together strengthen us for that task. We give you thanks for Jesus and ask that you hear us now as we pray together that prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. When Jesus was at table with his disciples, Many believe at a Passover meal, a Jewish celebration, he took the bread that was already before them and blessed, and he broke it. And he gave it to his friends, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, give it for you. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup that was before them, and he said, this cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, blood poured out for the forgiveness of all your sins. Whenever you drink of it, remember. celebrate communion here at Mount Vernon by intinction. The bread is gluten-free, so we invite everyone to come forward, take a piece of bread, dip it into the cup, and then return to your seats by the side aisle. Friends, again, taste this morning. See yet again, God is
now to him who by his spirit's work in each one of us is able to do abundantly more than anything we hope, dream, or even dare to imagine. To him be all glory and honor in our lives and in this church, now and forever. And all God's people agree and say, Amen. Amen.